I want to preach a message we've entitled The Significance of Christ's Death. And when we just think about what's taken place in our life, the ingenuity of man has made great strides and, and, and great significance in, in the way things are done in our lives today. I, just let me take a moment to explain that. You, you just think about, for instance, uh, our transportation. Do you realize that mankind, not too many years ago, was still walking where he needed to go? And then he got to be able to ride horse and a horse and buggy and so on and so forth. And then from the horse came the automobile. And people thought, man, how great this is. And those, those, those things are very significant in the lives of mankind as you see these changes taking place. And then from the automobile, now we have the uh, air travel, airplanes and, and jets. I mean, you can, go, you can go from coast to coast just in a, just in a few hours simply by you know, jumping on a plane and taking off. See, that's made great significance in the way we do things. And see, it's changed our lives. That's what I want you to realize is these changes, the significance of what this, these have done is made difference in the way we do things, the way we, the, the way we are. And uh, if, if, after we think about that, uh, let's think about communication. At one time, if you look in your early history, you, I, I'm so, just get so amazed at how the Indians used to communicate. Now this may be just the Western shows we used to watch, but they'd send them smoke signals up. So many puffs meant this and so many puffs meant that. So they communicated with, with smoke signals. And then we went from smoke signals to a telegraph. Do you remember then things they would used to tap out the Morse code? And then from the Morse code, we went to the telephone and people began to hook up to a wire. And boy, now I'm telling you what, uh, now we've, we've got cell phones and, and, and email and, and iPhones. You, it's just amazing what people can do. Communication is just almost inst instantaneously worldwide. You can get communication. All over the world. I'm going to tell you, that's of great significance to us. And it affects the way you and I live. Because we are constantly in communication with people all over. I mean, you can't hide much anymore because people, if you've got a cell phone, people can find you. And they, they, can, and they can chase you down. Now, some people choose not to have one. And I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's not a real, that's not a bad idea uh, to do that because life is just so full right now. It seems like we're bombarded from every area, from all this information. By the way, you know, through the, through the means of television, you and I are receiving information that these earlier people never had. I mean, we get things that goes on all over the whole world and we have to bring it into ourselves and process it. And see, that makes a, that, that's a great significance to us. And then let's look at the medical field. The medical field used to have like ancient remedies. And then there was herbal doctors, doctors who would take different roots and different plants and make things. By the way, medicine's made out of all that anyway. But then see, we, we've, gone from, we've gone from that to highly specialized medicines. The reason I say highly special, specialized medicines, last week I went over to, the, to get a medical test done to see how my heart was getting along and, and uh, they, they gave me a, they asked me if I want to do the treadmill or do I want the chemical? And I thought, well, what's the chemical? He said, well, it'll, it'll keep you from having to sweat on the treadmill and we get a better reading. I said, well, whatever, whichever one it takes to get the best reading, that's what I want because that's why I'm here. I want to know what's going on. Is there blockages or what is and what's happening? And they said, oh, the, the chemical will definitely, we'll be able to see anything that's wrong for sure because this chemical uh, makes it as if your heart has been racing and we can see whatever is going on with nuclear medicine. I, see, I got nuked and didn't even know what all that meant. But anyway, they, they put that little vial of stuff and shot it into my, and buddy, immediately, whoosh, it was like a flood and hot and everything, and I thought, whoo, goodness, my heart went to fly and all that kind of stuff. But see, that, see, that's the advances. See, man's technology is just, it's just out, of, it's growing like crazy. And see, we don't know what's going to take place. As far as communication, the next thing it might be, it might be, it may be like beam me up. That pretty soon we might transport. We might not need automobiles. It may be beam me over there and beam me over there. You see, we never know what what'll take place in this life here. But you see, it may be that what we're seeing in our society today is that man's heart 
in general in America is not turning toward God because the statistics show that there's less people in church, there's less people committed to God now than there was just a few years ago. And I ask myself the question, is mankind depending on man's ingenuity or is he really trusting God? Is there a real trust in God or is there a trust in the ingenuity and the inventions of mankind? Has, has those things kind of replaced man's need for God in our present society that we live in? I want to declare to you this morning that as we approach this Easter, we're celebrating the resurrected Jesus. I want to remind us of one of the most significant events that's ever occurred in our history. And that event was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as we, this morning, I want to show several ways Christ's death is significant for you. How is his death significant for you? What does it mean to you or for you that Christ died? Does it really make a difference that 2,000 years ago, this man they called Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary and died? What does it mean? Now, one of the things I want to show us this morning, that Jesus said on the cross, he said, it is finished. Now, the work that he was sent to here to do was finished. That's something I want to, I want to remind you over and over again. There's no more work on God's part to be done. Everything he's going to do, he's done. When he died that death on the cross of Calvary, his promises Everything that was required, all requirements, because he was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God that was sacrificed. So that means that there's great significance in that death. And the first thing I want to show you this morning is that his death was significant to remove our sins. To remove our sins. Now, a lot of people don't realize that their sin's gone, but you know, according to Scripture, I'm not necessarily talking to you this morning about how we feel about it. I'm talking about what does Scripture say. According to Scripture, our sins are gone. Look at 1 John 3 and verse 5. And you know that he was manifested, notice this, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. So what did he do in his death? His death is able, therefore, to take away our sin. When I get a hold of that concept, I see in Christ Jesus, my sin is gone because they died the death that Jesus died for me and so therefore sin no longer has hold on me. Why? Because they're gone. They, they left when Jesus died on the cross. Now that's what he did for the, all the world, for all mankind. But see, the problem is, is in the people having ability to put their faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has already done. People struggle. They just can't somehow or another, they can't come to grip with it. But the fact is that the Apostle John said that he was, man, why, why was Jesus even revealed on the earth? Man, he, that he was manifested to take away our sins. So you see, that death tells us plainly that our sins are removed. Hebrews 1 and 3, the writer there, he says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, notice this, purged our sins. Purged, that word purged it means that they're, they're cleared out, they're gone out of the way. If, if something's purged, it's cleansed. It's, it's, there's no, they're no longer there. They're purged. They're gone. We, he said, by himself. Now, how did he do it? Because he died the death that we're supposed to pay. The death that we're supposed to die, Jesus paid it. He died it in our place. And by himself, purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, I don't know whether you've seen the revelation concerning where Christ is or not, but listen, I want you to know that you're in Christ Jesus. If you've received him as Lord and Savior, you're in him. And wherever he is, you have to be. And my prayer is that you see yourself seated in the throne room with the Lord Jesus Christ because you are the church. You're, you're the body of Christ. And so there you are. 
Whether you, whether you understand it or not, I want to declare to you this morning, church, that is where you are, that is who you are. You are in Christ Jesus, you are seated in the heavenlies. Oh, Brother Bill, I don't, I don't feel like that. It's not up to your feelings. It's up to what the Word of God says. If the Word of God says it, I, I, I pray that you would declare it for you and stand up on that Word by faith. How do you receive this great revelation? You receive it the same way you got saved. You receive salvation because you trusted that the blood of Jesus was sufficient to pay your sin debt, so therefore you stepped into the very life of God. And so now you're in Jesus. And your sins are gone. Your sins are no more. Why? Because they have, they have been put into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you again. Also, look with me this morning. The blood of, the, the Christ's death is sufficient to crucify the flesh for us. Terminating the old man. Now, I could preach right there for three hours. I really could. I'm not going to, don't get scared. I'm not going to, but I could stay right there a long time. Here is the area where most people allow Satan to still hold on to them. They can't get free from self, so therefore they allow Satan. It's, something, it's not something God's doing. God has set them free. The Lord Jesus' blood cleansed us and set us free. We are free, church. I, I can't overemphasize that. Freedom belongs to you. Whether you've realized it or not, I don't know. But brother, whenever you do realize that you're free in Jesus and you're seated in the heavens with the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll get into your emotion, it'll shake you up, and it'll make you want to praise God and, and glorify his name and make you want to live right. It'll give you strength to overcome those temptations when temptation comes your way. And by the way, temptation will come your way because the devil is on his job. He's doing his job, but there'll be strength and there'll be power for you. Notice with me Romans 6, verse 6. Now notice how, notice how clear the passage is here. The apostle Paul says, knowing this. Well, knowing what? Paul says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. You see, where's the old man? See, that's what we're talking about, terminating the old man. Well, the old man has been dealt with. Why do we let him hang around in our lives, the old man, whenever he's been terminated? When he's been dealt with, you know the cross of Jesus dealt with the old man, but boy, we don't want to let him go. We just want to give ourselves part of the way to the Lord because we want to hold on to the other areas in our life. But boy, whenever that revelation opened up, to, yes, it is. I mean, our old man is crucified. Crucified, I think, means put to death, don't you? I believe that's what the word means. It's crucified with him. I have a message I preach on this one verse. And in, in the Lord leading, I'll do it again. I, I know good and well. I won't, I won't go too many months till I preach this message here in this church again or wherever God leads me to preach it. You see, he said that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is that body of sin? Well, you're looking at it. Here's the body of sin. This is the sin. This is the body that sins. You know why it sins? It don't sin because it's flesh and blood. It sins because of the will that's inside the body. It sins because the soul is there. And there's where I make my decisions and I decide and I make decisions and then I decide to do things that's against God. And so therefore, there's where the body of sin is destroyed. In other words, put in neutral. Look here. He says that we should henceforth, in other words, from here on, we should not serve sin. So if you sin a little bit every day and can't help it, I understand what you mean. But I want to declare to you that you can sin less if you want to. Did I kind of get an amen right there? You can sin less. I didn't say sinless. I said you can sin less if you want to. And now you'll figure that out. You, I mean, because every, every time I do something wrong, it's like that I know it before it happens. It's just like, there it is, right and wrong. Don't, don't do it. You've seen these pictures of this little angel and little devil sitting on the shoulder talking. That could not be a better illustration. But the decision is, which one are you going to pay attention to? And see, that's where, we, that's where we get our information from. But see, God has so made us a free will, and he's made us that way because he don't want us to be like a little machine that follows him because we have to. We love him because he first loved us and we obey him. Why? Because we love him, we obey him. And we listen to his spirit and then his spirit guides our life. Galatians 5, 16. 
Paul says this. He says, he said, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the death of Christ has given us this great ability, this great freedom. See, that is, it's significant to crucify the flesh for us. That's, that's what the death of the Lord Jesus Christ does. And not only that, but his death is significant to us to destroy Satan who has the power, who has the power of death. Look at Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, he became human. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Do you realize that the devil has been destroyed? You say, well, why is he aggravating me to death if he's been destroyed? And that's a logical question. That's a good one too. But here's what you've got to understand. God's word is eternal. We look at things right in the here and now. But when I read that, the power, of, the power of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he came and through death destroyed the devil. I read over on the end of the book and I see the devil and the old serpent, the snake, all that kind of stuff thrown into that bottomless pit. A thousand years later he comes out and then from there he's taken and put into the, into the second death which is, which is the lake of fire forever and forever and forever. So you can't tell me that the devil has not been destroyed. It's as good as done. That's where his home is. That's where he's going to be through all the endless, endless ages of eternity. So you see, even though we have to put up with his aggravations here and now, you just have faith. He is destroyed. The Bible bears out he destroyed the death of Jesus. He was defeated at the cross that day. And I, I, want to, I just want to make sure that we understand that. Not only, not only did he come, does it destroy Satan, who has the power over death, but notice also, his death is significant to judge the world. To judge the world. In Acts 17, 30, 30, 31, he says, Paul in his defense there, he, or, or excuse me, the apostle, we have the apostle Paul in his defense there, he says, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, notice this, by that man whom he had ordained, and that was Jesus Christ. Wherefore, he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. He was raised from the dead. And that is the, that, that demonstrates the power of God by raising Jesus from, puts a seal on all these promises God's given us. That puts a seal on them. He says, look in Psalms 11, verses, verses five and six. He says this, he said, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loves violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked shall he rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be their portion and their, their cup. You see, that death gives him the ability to judge the world. One thing you want to realize and understand, these people out here walking in wickedness, doing their own thing their own way, their day is coming. If they do not get their heart right with God, don't you never fear. They may look like they're living in splendor, having a wonderful time, enjoying themselves, doing all kinds of wickedness, but God hates every bit of it. And he's provided a place and a way. Right now, we're living in the grace dispensation when God's grace is there for anybody who will come. The Bible tells us, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Notice what he says in Matthew 31. Matthew 25, 31, he says, this parable he gives here, he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. In verse 33, he says, and he, he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats he puts on his left. So here you see and understand that the Lord Jesus has the ability to judge the world. And I'm, I'm amazed when I read in scripture that where Paul teaches us that we as saints of God, 
we too are going to have part in that judgment that God has given his, the saints that opportunity. Even though, see, we're in Christ and we're going to have that opportunity there in eternity, somewhere, somehow, to have part of this judgment. I want you to see this morning, church, how significant that death is. See, all this wouldn't be if Jesus Christ had not have died. If he had not been on the cross that day when he knew he had fulfilled everything God had told him to do and he made that declaration, it is finished. The, the work that I'm to do is finished. There'll be nothing else done. But see, the sad part about that, there's so many people who are going to hear that report and not receive the word that God gives through his mighty, mighty plan. I've got, I've got several more points that I don't have time to make them this, this morning, but just, just simply because of time. And I'll, I'll reserve the right to finish them a little bit later. But here, just in conclusion this morning, I want to say to you, when Neil Armstrong stepped out of that spacecraft and he stepped over onto the moon, for the first time, man, ever done it. Boy, what a great thing that was. He even spoke, he even said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, is what he said. Many of you remember that. It was on TV. We saw it as it took place. We saw it live. We heard those words that he said. But you see, that event, that event was of great significance. But you know, all the modern technology, everything that's happened, it has significance on us also. But there's nothing, that there, there's nothing that's ever taken place that has any more significance to mankind as this precious gift that God gave. And that's how he chose to give his darling son to pay a sin debt that you and I owed. Amen. And he went to the cross, gladly paid that sin debt, and now he's seated to the right hand of the Father, waiting on you and I to make our decision. It's almost like that this place is just a preparation place. It's just a place to get our clothes on when we're going to that heavenly home. One of these days, we're gonna be free from this body. We're not gonna be trapped here and held here. Right now, we're pretty much here. We've got our senses, and pretty soon, we're gonna be set free from that. We're gonna have a new body. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I hope is that you receive Jesus, you've already got new life. You know, the song says we're going to have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. My prayer is you've got a new life now. It's just that we're still hanging around in this robe we've got on now. We're going to put it off and we're going to be walking in that glorious place. But here's a question for us this morning. I want to ask you this question. What does the death of Jesus mean to you? Is it really, is it really something that speaks to you? Is it something that God has really opened in your understanding that, you know what, I'd be lost. I'd be lost if it was not for that precious death that Jesus died. Another question. Do you know for certain that you'd go to heaven? I ask everybody in here, I'm, gonna ask, I'm sincerely with all my heart, young and old, Church member, non-church member. You've been on the way for years. None of that makes any difference right now. I'm going to ask you this one question. Do you know for certain in your heart today that if you died, you'd go to heaven? Never be a more important question in this life asked to you. Because as you've heard in Scripture today and as I've shown you in Scripture Christ's death has a great significance for you. The question is, will you let it be that significant for you? Is it something that you're willing to do? Are you willing to accept his, his death as payment for your sin debt and then step into his life and begin to live his life? Now, Christian living is not really easy. A lot of people try to make it think so, but it's not. It's not, it's not easy. Matter of fact, it's unnatural. Think about it. What's natural to live an Adam life is natural. Unnatural is to live a Jesus life. But boy, I tell you, when you get in Jesus, all these troubles and things like that, there's so much joy in your heart that you, you can go through whatever because of the joy of the Lord. 
Again, I'll ask you, do you know for certain if you died today that you'd go to heaven? If you don't, you can know today. And here's how you do it. You place your trust in Jesus that his death is sufficient payment for your sin and that you're placing your trust in the finished work of the cross and the Holy Spirit comes into you. People go through religious motions and never get saved. That's possible. But I'm just telling you, it's not on what you do, it's on what you believe. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 9.10 says that you will be saved. But you, you have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Then the Bible says you'll be saved. Stand with me this morning.